watching The 7 from WATE 6 on your side. Good evening, I'm Bo Williams and welcome to The 7. Let's get a look at the Big 7 stories right now. And reporter Lexi Spivak joins us for the first story topping the list tonight. UT's mask mandate, it was lifted and then in less than 24 hours, the head of the Knoxville campus said it would be coming back. Here's Lexi now with more on why. UT Chancellor Dondi Plowman put it best when she said, quote, things are changing quickly. In a letter sent out this afternoon, it stated that the university plans to put a mask requirement back in place for most campus buildings starting Monday, November 22nd. This all started when employees received an email from UT System President Randy Boyd lifting that mask mandate last night. That was all to comply with a new Tennessee law prohibiting mask and vaccine mandates. The University of Tennessee says federal funding would have been at stake if it continued to comply with that state law. So the university applied for an exemption to that law. The exemption was granted, which is how the university can again comply with the federal laws. So here's where things stand. Again, there are plans to bring back that mask requirement starting next Monday, November 22nd. Plowman said, quote, until that time, please make whatever personal choice you think is best while being respectful of your students and fellow employees. Bo, back to you. All right, Lexi, thank you. Now, Plowman also said in today's letter they would share information about the federal vaccine mandate and how to comply on Monday. As for why Monday is the key date here, UT officials say it is waiting on court rulings. Those could come by the end of this week. Next to the Big 7, a Knoxville man is thankful his wife is alive after she fell about 12 feet onto concrete. J.J. Stambaugh says that his wife, Jenna, slipped through the attic floor at her dad's house over the weekend. Jenna's back is broken in five places. She also broke her pelvis and ribs. Now, she was flown to UT Medical Center, where she is recovering this evening. Now the community is rallying to help. A friend organized a fundraiser and with community support, quickly surpassed a $5,000 goal. When I first heard that call, the first thing I'm thinking of is, oh my God, is she dead? Is she brain damaged? Is she paralyzed? What's happening? Um, and um, she had her only car. So I'm stuck here with no vehicle or transportation. Can't get to UT waiting for her dad to route everything and run and come get us to take us there. So I have no news or anything. And that was one of the longest, that was a very long time. It seemed to take forever. And we finally got there and I go back there. And she's conscious. She's hurting, but she's conscious. She can move her toes. Okay. JJ has some good news to share with us today. Doctors say Jenna does not need surgery on her pelvis, and it is possible she could come home by Thanksgiving. Some big news in the Noah Clare case is next in the Big Seven tonight. The car believed to belong to Jacob Clare, father of missing Noah, has now been found in San Clemente, California. This is near San Diego, and well, when you take a look at the car, it's dusty. Apparently, the spare wheel appears to be flat, and there are MREs, meals ready to eat, in the floorboard. The TBI has also upgraded the case to an Amber Alert and upgraded the charges against his father, Jacob Clare. He is now facing a charge of aggravated kidnapping and custodial interference. He's about six feet, seven inches tall. If you know anything that might help, <clears throat> excuse me, in this case, you need to call 1 800 TBI FIND. All right, next in the Big 7, an update on a TVA spill. We want to get you up to date on. A Roan County grand jury was not able to agree on a criminal charge in the handling of the cleanup at the Kingston Fossil Plant spill site. But grand jurors say the evidence is something federal investigators should look into. And this goes back to the 2008 spill when a wave of water and coal ash flooded neighboring homes, land, and into the Emory River. A lot of you may recall that. Well, TVA brought in Jacobs Engineering for the cleanup. A process that took more than five years. Workers at the site complained that they were not given enough protection from the ash. Now, they sued, claiming they suffered health problems and that workers had died due to exposure to toxins. Yesterday, the grand jury met for nine hours listening to evidence from investigators. Attorney General Russell Johnson says it was a split result, two to ten against charges, and he shared a statement from the grand jury saying, quote, we were unable to come to a unanimous decision on any state criminal charge, although we found much of the evidence about TBA and Jacob's handling of the cleanup relative to worker safety very concerning, end quote. In the next Big 7 story for you, a father faces charges after his son was found on a sidewalk. This happened in White Pine. According to police, a driver heard the baby crying and stopped to find the boy face down near Main Street at Maple. A police report tells us the temperature was right around 34 degrees. 
An officer found the suspect, Juan Cervantes, in the middle of the road about 300 yards away. He could not stand up on his own and had to be taken to the hospital. Cervantes' SUV was found wrecked on some railroad tracks with no car seat inside. Officers say surveillance video shows someone running down the street from the crash site, putting the baby down, then running off. First responders took the baby to East Tennessee Children's Hospital for head and neck injuries. Our next Big 7 list for you tonight, opioids hitting our community harder than any recorded year. The Knox County District Attorney's Office says now that more than 400 suspected overdose deaths have been reported for the first time. And the year is not over yet, as you know. Previous record, 383 in 2020. Suspected overdose deaths stayed under 300 in 2017, 18, and 2019. Now, earlier in the month, we heard from District Attorney General Sharm Allen, who told us that COVID-19 is partly to blame, but so is the potency of drugs with the powerful painkiller fentanyl found in almost every street drug. Rounding out our Big 7 for you, only one vote is left now before the plans for the new mixed-use stadium can move forward. The Knoxville City Council is meeting right now, set to vote soon on an agreement with the Sports Authority. If passed, the agreement gives the Sports Authority the power to issue bonds for this new stadium. Now, last night, the Knox County Commission voted unanimously to join the agreement. Tonight's City Council vote could make or break this deal. However, not everyone is on board. You know, yesterday, Councilwoman Amelia Parker submitted a packet of questions and concerns about the development and lease agreements. She raises several concerns about the timeline of the project, potential risks to the city. At the moment, Council is hearing public comment. Now, reporter Jordan Brown is inside the meeting, live tweeting the discussion. Follow on her. You can follow her uh, and keep an eye on what's happening. On the alerts from your app, you'll be able to... Uh, be first to know about the vote, and we'll have a wrap-up for you tonight at 11 o'clock. So be sure to join us then. Got to thank Ken Weathers for the water. Thanks for hanging with me. I don't know what <laughs> happened there, Ken. I just all of a sudden I couldn't talk. Meteorologist.